turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 16 and verse 6 through verse 15. Acts chapter 16, verse 6 through 15. And this is what the Holy Scripture says. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to uh, Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily held, made. And uh, we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia had us. She was a seller of purple from uh, the city of Tyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now we're here looking at scripture. If you have your Bibles, maybe you turn with me to Acts chapter 16, which we, we read a little bit of it just now. But we're looking at verses 6 to 40, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 40. Now let me begin by saying that I'm so glad that you are looking at the book of Acts. And the reason why I'm glad about that is that it's the book of Acts that tells us what the Christian faith is. Now the Christian faith has been around for 2,000 years And the Bible, a lot of it has been around for about 3,000 years. You would think that by now, the world ought to know what the gospel is. You would think after 2,000 years of the Christian church being around, that people ought to know what the Christian faith is and what it consists of. But actually, they don't. You only have to watch TV or read your newspapers or listen to people talking about the church And you will very soon see, if you listen to them carefully, that they really haven't the slightest idea what the Christian faith is. Listen listen to the politicians. Let's read your newspaper, watch TV. And you'll find people saying, well, the church should be doing this, and the church should be doing that. And they're, they're telling the church what it is and what it should be doing. But actually, you'll find, if you keep on listening, that they haven't the slightest idea, really, what the church is. They think of the church as a, a kind of morality institution. They go around telling people to be good. They help the government a little bit. And they, uh, they help the poor. That's, that's, those things are all right. But they, they think of the Christian church as a kind of general, benevolent kind of society uh, for themselves. But of course, there's nothing specifically Christian about that. You can be a Muslim and try and help the government. You can be a Hindu and try and help the government. You can be a pagan. You can be an atheist. All sorts of people try to help the world and do good and spread around a little bit of morality. There's nothing specially Christian about that. If you want to know what the gospel is, read the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the story of the origin of the Christian church. It all begins with with facts of history. It tells us that there was a man called Jesus who was the son of God who died upon a cross, who claimed to be the one dying for the sins of the world. It tells us about one particular man who was risen from the dead and his disciples were willing to die rather than deny that they knew he was risen from the dead. It tells us about a day in history, April, maybe AD 33, when the Holy Spirit was poured out 
And 3,000 people were immediately brought to salvation and began to be worshippers of Jesus. It tells us about sin. It begins by telling us that everybody everywhere is a sinner and we cannot relate to God unless our sin is dealt with. It tells us that Jesus died upon a cross to pay the price of our sins. It tells us that Jesus has conquered death. This is, this is the gospel. It is the book of Acts that tells us what the gospel is. And we have to spend a lot of our time telling the world what the gospel is. They really do not know. They really think the gospel is just about being prosperous or improving society or being good. Anybody can tell the world to be good. We're not telling the world to be good. Actually, if you're good, you think you're good. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous. You think you're righteous? Well, the gospel is not for you. The gospel is not about, about, uh, about helping righteous people to have a, a nice life. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came, said Jesus, to bring sinners to repentance. It's a message about sin. It's a message about salvation and so on. And then the book of Acts goes on to tell us that this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is needed by the whole world. The world has been around for a long time and the Christian gospel has been around for 2,000 years, but we're still in trouble. The world is still in trouble. You only have to look at Syria or Mr. Trump in America or all these, this, these things in, South, in, in Saudi Arabia. Just look around, watch your TV, and you can see the world is in trouble. It needs the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ so much. And it's only, it's only the gospel that changes society. It's only the gospel that really brings true knowledge of God. And so if you really are a saved person, if you really are a Christian church, one thing that it will be upon your heart is a kind of a desperation that everybody will want this message. Everybody will need this message. And so the book of Acts goes on to tell us how Sooner or later, as Christians get moving, sooner or later, they want to tell everybody else about this gospel. And so in this great book of Acts, you find that as things get going, they start going on missionary journeys. And this uh, chapter that we're thinking about, Acts chapter 16, it's really the story of what we call the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul, the greatest persecutor of the Christian church in those early days was a man called Saul of Tarsus. But in the middle of his persecution, he suddenly and dramatically was saved and brought to know Jesus. And the worst persecutor, Saul of Tarsus, became the Apostle Paul, and the greatest missionary there ever was. And uh, he begins to go, after a while, he begins to go on these missionary journeys. And it all begins with the Holy Spirit. One day they're praying, Acts chapter 13, they're praying, and as they're praying, they are convinced that the Holy Spirit is speaking to them, and they want to send out Paul and Barnabas, and they start traveling. And Paul goes up to Syria, around to Tarsus, where he was born, and he starts preaching the gospel. Churches come into being in Galatia, in the south of that area. And then they come back again to Antioch and report what's happened. And then after a while, they are sent out on a second missionary journey. That begins in Acts chapter 14. It comes at a certain point where they say, well, let's go back to Galatia, where we came from, and uh, see how they're doing. And they go out again, only this time they start going even further. They're going on these missionary journeys, wanting to spread this gospel. And if you really come to this great salvation in Jesus... You, you want to do that. You feel that way. If you are a Christian, you can hardly bear the thought that everybody else is maybe not a Christian. You, you're desperate for your own family to be saved. You want other people in other parts of the world where the gospel doesn't seem to have gone. You want everybody to know about this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what happens to them. And they, they go on these missionary journeys, desperate to spread this gospel of Jesus. And that's what you're thinking about here in Nairobi Baptist Church. It's time to do some reaping, and you can't do any reaping until you do some sowing. It's time to reach out. It's time to spread this gospel everywhere. And that's the theme of this chapter. And so out they go, traveling up to Syria and then round along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea till they get to Troas. And when they get to Troas, there's a big ocean in front of them. They really can't go anymore, and that's where they are. Now, what I want to do 
this morning in these few moments that we have is to see uh, exactly how they did it. How did, how did they do this uh, spreading of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? When you're wanting to reach out, when you're wanting people to be saved, how do you actually do it? What, how does God guide you? How does God show you the way? And so there are some things I want you to notice here in this chapter. The first one is this. That as you're seeking to reach out, whether as a church or whether as individual people, guidance is really a kind of combination of what I would call common sense and the sudden guidance of God. To begin with, it's a matter of common sense. These apostles say to themselves, well, let's go back to where we were before. There's no special uh, revelation from God at this particular point. If you've started a church somewhere, it's just common sense to go back after a while and see how they're doing. Which, come to think of it, is what I'm doing. You come back and you see how Nairobi Baptist Church is doing. And so they, they start out on a second missionary journey. And they go back to Galatia. They reach these various uh, places where they've been before. And uh, I want you to notice that it's a very simple thing. They don't start a missionary society. I'm not saying that's wrong, but, but they don't do that. They don't have some big management team. They don't start a theological college. They really don't do very much at all. They just say, well, let's just go back. It's a very simple thing. They're just, they're just uh, using their common sense and doing things in a very simple way. And it's always good in the Christian church to do things in a simple way. I find in Nairobi generally that so many churches... They tend to try to run the church as though it's a big business. And there's endless committees and so on. Well, when you read your New Testament, what you are struck with is its simplicity. A couple of men, Paul and Silas, say, well, let's, let's just go and travel and uh, see how these churches we started. Only two of them. And see how they're doing. And they, and they go off in a very simple way. And guidance is like that. Most of the time, you don't need guidance. I'm wearing my Mandela shirt this morning. I can tell you, I didn't pray about it. I didn't say, Lord, please guide me this morning whether I should tie up my shoelaces. Lord, please guide me what shirt I should put on. No, 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 you don't pray for guidance for those things. The Lord gives you a lot of freedom. You don't have to pray about tiny little things. The Lord gives you freedom. He gives you the desires of your hearts. And a lot of the time... Doing things for God, it begins with with a matter of common sense. You don't have to pray whether you tie your shoelaces or what tie you wear to church. You just do what you like. You're free. God gives you a lot of freedom. But then you will find that as you're just living life and doing things which are just uh, the obvious and just using what, what we call our common sense, you'll find that God will, as it were, interrupt you or he'll block you. Or you'll start trying to do something. You had it here in this passage. We read, we read it just now. Here they are. They're, they're traveling. And suddenly they want to go to Bithynia. And the Lord forbids them. They are forbidden to go into Bithynia. So they start wanting to go south to Asia where there's Ephesus, the capital city. And they start wanting to go there. And the Lord forbids them. They begin with, with common sense. They begin to saying, well, let's, let's do the obvious. Let's just go back and uh, see these churches which we started before. And maybe we'll go a bit further. And then suddenly, as they're doing it, and they're trying to go somewhere, suddenly the Lord, as it were, interrupts. And they are forbidden. They they feel that they ought not to do this. So I say to you that guidance is often a kind of combination between what is obvious and common sense, there's nothing very special about it, and then suddenly you'll find that God will block you, or he'll give you a kind of conviction. Remember him, Acts chapter 13, The Spirit says, set aside Saul and Barnabas. Or remember in another place, the Spirit said to Philip, go speak to that man in that chariot. Suddenly there comes, as it were, some guidance, a a kind of instruction from the Holy Spirit, or a kind of forbidding that comes from the Holy Spirit. I say that guidance is a matter of largely doing the obvious and just seeing what needs to be done. You don't especially need, as it were, visions or dreams or revelations. You just do the obvious, you use your common sense. Or I could put it like this, that guidance is God's job more than it's your job. You, you do your duty. You do what you ought to do. You use your common sense. And then you'll find that God will step in and he'll block you or he'll guide you or he'll lead you. Guidance is largely God's job. 
You do your duty. You do what you know is right. You do what you are feeling called to do uh, and using your own gifts, and then you'll find God will be there and he'll be guiding you. And so what happens here is, as they are traveling, they find themselves wanting to go a bit further, but suddenly the Lord, as it were, forbids them. Do you know anything about this? Do you know what it is for yourself to be about to do something, nothing especially wrong with it, no reason why you shouldn't do it, but you suddenly have a kind of feeling that God does not want you to do it. You suddenly feel, no, no, I just don't feel this is right. It's not that the thing is wrong. It wouldn't be wrong to go to Bithynia. It wouldn't be wrong to go down south to Asia and Ephesus. But uh, suddenly they feel forbidden. They feel, no, God's not in this. And when you feel, when you have that kind of feeling, you should always take notice of it. Something that's not particularly wrong, but you, you feel you shouldn't do it. I, I had it a few years ago. A few years ago, I was about to go to a city in Australia. There was a man there who was running a, a group of churches, and he was in some difficulties, and I felt maybe I could help him. And he asked me to go and preach for him, so I was all ready to go. But then as I came to get ready to go, I had a strange kind of feeling that I, I ought not to go. It was a city in Australia, with a big string of churches. I just had this kind of conviction that I ought not to go there. So I just let the thing lapse. I just didn't do anything. I just, I just let it collapse. And I never went there. A few months later, at about the time when I was uh, meant to be there, but I, I didn't go, the man I was trying to help sent out a letter to all of his churches. And it was a very tough letter. He said, you're either with me or you're against me. You either support me or you go. And he sort of half threw out half of his churches. And I suddenly realized why the Lord would not let me go. I would have been wasting my time. He wouldn't have listened to me. He'd already decided what to do. He, he damaged his, his uh, ministry. He made some bad mistakes. He wasn't ready to listen to, to anybody. And I would have got caught up with some fight I didn't want to be caught up in. I wouldn't have been able to help him. But the Lord gave me that kind of conviction. Don't go, you'll be wasting your time. And I never went there. That was, a, that was quite a big thing. Often it's a very small thing. Some little thing, you want to do it, but you feel, no, no, God's not in this. And you should take notice. You, you might want to ask the question, why did God do this? Why did God forbid Paul to go south to Ephesus or to go north to Bithynia? Well, I think I know. If he went to, to Ephesus, he'd only be there for a few days. He wouldn't be able to do very much. He was traveling to Jerusalem. He would, be, he would be going back to Jerusalem. A little later, a few years later, he would spend three years in Ephesus. It was the wrong time. A bit later, he would spend three years in that place. But this was not the right time. Why did he not get permission from God to go to Bithynia? I think I know the answer to that as well. You see, Bithynia is where Peter went. When you read 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, you'll find Peter's first letter is written to the exiles of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter would be in those places. God did not want Paul to be there because he was about to send Peter there. And when you're starting a church, you don't start a church next door to somebody else who's starting a church. He, he, that was being left to Peter to do. So God didn't want Paul in Ephesus, not yet. He didn't want Paul in Bithynia. Peter was going to go there. And Paul had this kind of conviction he should not go. Now, what do you do when God, as it were, leaves you in that place where you're stuck? He didn't want to go back east. That's where he came from. He didn't want to, as it were, go back home. He, he was forbidden from going, to, from going north to Bithynia. He was forbidden to go south to Asia and Ephesus. And in front of him was Troas and the sea. There was nothing but a big ocean in front of us. What do you do when you can't go north and you can't go east and you can't go west and you can't go south? I'll tell you what to do. You stay where you are. And you call upon God to guide you and help you. And Paul can't, doesn't want to go backwards, home, he can't go forwards, the, the sea's there, he can't, he can't go to Bithynia, he can't go south, he stays where he is and he prays. And that night, that night, he has a vision, and God gives him something which he had not thought of. And God 
shows him something, and he says, come over. What does that mean? It means come over the sea. It's two or three hundred miles away. Two or three hundred miles away. Across that ocean is Europe. The gospel's never been to Europe. There's Philippi and Thessalonica, these places in Europe, over the ocean. And he gets a vision. Come over to Macedonia, two or three hundred miles away over the ocean. Come over to Macedonia and help us. He had not thought of that. When God, as it were, lets you get stuck and you can't go north and you can't go east or south or west, stay where you are, you may find that God's got something big for you which is bigger and greater than anything you ever thought of. And he'll lead you and guide you and open up the way. That's what happens. I say guidance is a matter of doing the obvious. But as you're doing the obvious and just using your common sense and following your duty, sometimes you'll get stuck. Sometimes you'll be forbidden. Sometimes God will show you something. Sometimes God will give you something far beyond anything you've ever dreamed of. That's how the gospel got to Europe. The gospel is not a European gospel. It didn't begin with Europe. No, no, it began in in Israel. It got to Africa first. The, The Ethiopian eunuch was saved before any European was saved. This is the first time when out of Asia Minor, Israel, Syria, Turkey, the gospel goes over the ocean and reaches Europe for the first time ever. And Paul finds that God has got something for him bigger than anything he ever dreamed of. But then the next thing I want you to notice is that as you follow and proceed in this way, using your common sense, reaching out to other people, sometimes being interrupted by God and shown new things that you hadn't thought of, you'll find that if you do that, you may well discover that very unusual things begin to happen. When you're really pioneering for God, you will find that unusual things begin to happen. And as this story goes forward, and they're being led and guided by God, this is the book of Acts. This is the book where God does unusual things. This is not just a a kind of vague religiosity. This is not just spreading around morality. This is not just telling people to be good. This is spreading the gospel of salvation. And when you do that, you may find, especially when you're pioneering, especially when you're doing new things for God, you may find that God will do unusual things for you. And I could give you many, many examples. Give me another hour or so and I'll give you a few examples. But um, you may well find that God does unusual things. And so they go off traveling further than they've been before. And they start reaching all sorts of people. They reach this lady called Lydia, who is saved. They are going by a certain place, Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. They're met by a slave girl who has a spirit of divination. They suddenly find they're dealing with people who are demon-possessed. They get arrested. They're in trouble. They're thrown in prison. There's an earthquake. All sorts of unusual things happen. At one point, they, they are blocked, and there's this vision. You don't get visions every day. Visions, well, they can happen. God can give us dreams. God can speak to us in all sorts of ways. But most of the time, we're just using our common sense. But when you're moving for God, you'll often find that unusual things begin to happen, especially if you're pioneering. I come from Frisco Fellowship these days, and we have lots of prayer meetings. On one occasion, I was in a situation in Nut Hall. You know Nut Hall in town? And uh, we were pioneering a new prayer meeting. It was a very small prayer meeting, just a few people there. We were pioneering something totally new. And I was there in a prayer meeting one day, and um, a lady came to see me. She said, would would you pray for a friend of mine who's sick? And she brought a handkerchief. She said to me, would would you pray for this handkerchief? I don't normally pray for handkerchiefs, but uh, normally... I just pray in an ordinary fashion. But she brought this handkerchief. She said, will you pray for this handkerchief? And I'll lay it upon my, my friend and you'll be healed. Well, I don't normally pray for handkerchiefs. But um, I was just going with her request. So I said, yeah, okay. And I pray that the Lord would uh, bless this sick person. And um, as this friend went back and laid the handkerchief upon her friend, she, he would be healed and so on. And then I forgot all about it. A couple of weeks later, I was back in the prayer meeting again. Very small prayer meeting. We were sort of pioneering in that part of town. And I saw this lady, and I remembered that I prayed for a handkerchief. And I said to her, oh, well, you know, what happened to your friend? Is he better now? 
And she said to me, oh no, you know, I, I got to the hospital and when I got there, he had died. And I said, oh, oh, you know, no, no, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh no, it's all right, it's all right. They were wheeling his body away on the trolley, taking him to the mortuary. But it was all right, I laid the handkerchief upon him and he woke up and he sat up and they had to take him back to the ward again. <laughs> Well, I don't expect, I don't experience things like that every day. But when you're pioneering for God, anything can happen. And here in this place, here's this unreachable man. Here's this Philippian jailer. He's just been beating up the apostle Paul and, and, and treating him badly. And Paul is wounded and bleeding. But he's all right. He's singing songs at midnight. And suddenly there's an earthquake. God can send you an earthquake when it's necessary. God can do anything to, 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 as it were, move forward the kingdom of God. And suddenly, this man, who you would think is totally unreachable, he's been worshipping Roman gods, he's never been to church in his life, he doesn't have a Bible. If there's anybody you think is never going to be saved in his life, it will be this Roman soldier. But you know, earthquakes have a way of softening you up a little bit. Earthquakes have a way of making you think about things that you hadn't thought of before. And suddenly, this man's in an earthquake... He can lose his life. If he loses any of those prisoners, he'll lose his life. Suddenly, he's in bad trouble. He's been hearing the gospel. He's been hearing Paul and Silas sing songs at midnight. And the only hope he's got or anything now is to listen to these guys who maybe can help him. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And that man is saved. And he's baptized at midnight. Paul doesn't even say, well, we have a service on Sunday, we'll baptize you. He says, no, I'm going to baptize you now. And he goes from nothing to being a full member of the Christian church in a matter of minutes. God can do anything when you are moving with him. And when you're reading this book of Acts, you're finding all these unusual things happening all the time. An earthquake and a, a demon possession and visions and dreams and wonders and voices, a voice of the Holy Spirit. And you're seeing all these things happening. When you're moving for God... God can do anything. He's with you. And he can do the unusual. Incidentally, don't think of the book of Acts as being unusual and you being normal. It's not that you are normal and the book of Acts is unusual. No, the act, the book of Acts is normal. If there's something abnormal, it's you. The book of Acts does not have to correspond to you. You have to correspond to the book of Acts. You have to fit the Bible and these things in the book of Acts. They show us what the gospel is like when it's moving, when the Spirit is moving in power, when things are happening because you're moving in obedience to God. And so the last thing I I want you to know this morning, and then I will stop, is that these men go out with a message. They are following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They are expect they are ready for anything to happen. But when they get opportunities and somebody says, well, what must I do then? What must I do then to be saved? They know the answer. They have a message. And when that Philippian jailer asks that question, they know exactly what to say. And they can say it in one sentence. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that's the most important thing. The most important thing, if you wish to spread the gospel, is to have a message that, you, that is worth saying. Listen, listen to what Paul says. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. When somebody asks you about the gospel, when you have a chance to say something, say it briefly. And notice what Paul does not say. He does not say, oh, well, start coming to church and if you come to church, we'll, you know, we'll help you a bit. He doesn't say, well, start, start trying to live a good life, and if you really live a good life, eventually God, God might save you. He doesn't even say, read your Bible. You know, I know I, Paul, Paul could have said, well, I wrote, I wrote Romans last week. Let me give you a copy of Romans, or read your Old Testament, and maybe you'll get saved. He doesn't talk about religion. He doesn't talk about church or Bible. He talks about Jesus. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus. Salvation is not about morality. It's not just about church. It's not even about Bible. Our salvation is about Jesus. You are saved by the Son of God. When you're talking to people, don't talk about church. Don't even talk about Bible so much. We believe in the Scriptures, of course. But talk about Jesus. The Saviour is Jesus. You are not saved at all unless you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And so Paul talks about Jesus, and he talks about faith. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he talks about salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and you will be saved. You will be rescued. You'll be rescued from the punishment of sin. You'll be rescued from the power of sin. You'll be rescued from the pollution of sin, the dirtiness, the uncleanness of sin. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's how we reach out. We use our common sense. We stay open to the guidance of God. We get ready for anything to happen. But above all, we have a message. We know what to say. And we talk about Jesus and faith and salvation. And that's how the church of the Lord Jesus Christ spreads around the world. The world needs it. They do not know what the gospel is. We've been around for 2,000 years and they still don't know. And we still have the job of telling them about Jesus, about faith, about salvation. Let's stand and I want to pray for you as we bring our service to a close shortly. Let's stand. (laughs) Our Father, we come to you again in Jesus' name. And we want to pray for our fellowship and our church here in this place. We pray that you will open doors for us. We pray that this may indeed be a harvest time, a sowing time, a reaping time. Put this gospel message upon our lips and help us to tell everybody everywhere what they need to know about Jesus, about faith, about such a great salvation. Do it for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise God.